Yeah. So uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit more about functions. In particular, I'm going to talk about composition of functions. Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, cardinality of sets. So cardinality is just a way of measuring the size of a set, uh, which works for infinite sets as well as finite ones. So this is roughly section 2.3. This is section 2.5. And then if I have time, I'll say a little bit more, uh, a bit more about writing. So let's start by talking about uh, functions. So, so last time we, we introduced, you know, we said what a set is, what a function is. And we, we also defined a spe some specific properties of functions that are going to turn out to be quite interesting. So we said a function f from a set a to b to a set b. Uh, is um, onto, uh, and a synonym for that is surjective. If uh, for every point in the codomain, uh, there exists some point in the domain, some element in, in the domain, uh, such that f of a is equal to b. Um, and we looked at some examples of functions that are onto and functions that are not onto. And uh, I'm going to begin by introducing this complementary concept of one to one. So a function f from a domain A to a codomain B, which are just some any sets, is a one to one, also called injective. If um, uh, for any two elements in the domain, Um, their images under f, so f of a1 is equal to f of a2, implies that a1 is equal to a2. Now, you know, the, the, the picture associated with this is you have your function mapping your set a to your set b. And what this is saying is that, well, if you have two elements, a1 and a2, then and they're different then they have to map to some different elements of the codomain so so so, so in particular you 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 can't have a, a collision so you can't have a situation we have two elements that map to the same because that would violate this uh this pro this uh definition right then you'd have a pair of a1 and a2 so that f1, f of a1 is equal to f of a2, but a1 and a2 are different. And this is easily seen to be logically equivalent to saying that for every pair of elements a1 and a2 in the uh, domain, uh, a1 not equal to a2 implies that f of a1 not equal to f of a2. Sometimes that's more intuitive. Sometimes the first one is more useful for proving that a function is one to one. Now, uh, these concepts, I said they're complementary to each other. And you know, why are they complementary? Well, to, to see why, maybe the easiest way is to introduce uh, another piece of terminology which is useful. So maybe I'll move this picture up here. Oh, okay. This is, I'm just trying to create a little more space. Uh, well, why not shrink it, actually? Yeah. Okay, so um, uh, so another concept which is useful is the inverse image of a set. So if f going from a to b is a function, and s is some subset of the codomain, uh, then uh, the inverse image of S is the set of all elements in the domain such that F of A is an S. Now, uh, there's a picture associated with this. Uh, actually, let me create some more space here. Okay, that wasn't 
Uh, okay, maybe I should just undo that. I guess I'm learning how to move these things around. Okay, fine. Let's uh, try that again. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll just write a little bit, why not? So, so, uh, so the picture associated with this is, again, you have this cartoon, you have a domain and a codomain, and you have your function f, and what this is saying is, well, if you take a subset s in the codomain, and you look at all the things that map to that, so, so sorry, that's not a very good picture, let me try that again. you get some set in the domain, right? And that's uh, F inverse, that's the inverse image of S. That's all the stuff that gets mapped to S. Uh, so, so this is useful because you, know, you, you can write these definitions of onto and one to one in terms of inverse images. So this is called the inverse in, image of S. The inverse image of S is this set. And uh, I can write some equivalent definitions of one to one and onto in terms of this concept of inverse image. So a function is onto if when you look at any element of the codomain, then there's some element of the domain that maps to it. And one way of saying that is for every element in the codomain, if you look at the inverse image of the set containing that one element, that set is not empty, right? There better be at least one thing mapping to be. So this has at least one element. All right, ELT for element. And similarly, uh, I can write an equivalent definition for one to one. So any so so any questions about that equivalence before I do that? Okay. And for one to one, I can also I, ha I have another equivalent definition in terms of inverse images. Here I'm saying that well, for every element in the codomain, there better not be two elements in the domain that map to it. And that's the same thing as saying that the inverse image of the set containing that one element has at most one element. So now you see why they're complementary. One is saying that there's at least one element in the domain mapping uh, that maps to every element of the codomain. And the other one is saying, well, is that for every element of the codomain, there's at most one element of the domain. So let's maybe look at some examples, but any questions before we get into the examples? Uh, Professor, what do you mean by ELT? At the element, element, at the, element. Oh, element, okay. Yep. Any other? Um, I have a question for the equivalent, equivalency of, um, the injection, how would you symbolize the sentence has at most one element? Uh, that's a great question. So how would you symbolize the at most one element? So this does lead uh, to uh, a concept we'll be looking at later in the, in the, in the lecture. So uh, if A is a finite set, Uh, absolute value of A denotes the number of elements in A. So, you know, A has at least one element is equivalent to this the cardinality. This is, this is called the cardinality. We'll discuss it in great detail, is at least one. Does that answer the question? 
Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. So, okay, let's maybe look at some examples to, to make this uh, sort of clear. Let's actually look at the examples we looked at last time. So we'll just look at them here, I guess. So we had a bunch of examples. We had the function from integers to itself, which just uh, squares an integer. We had the function from reals to non-negative reals, which again, just squares a real number. We had um, a function from reals to reals, which uh, exponentiates the real number. And then we had a function P from a non-empty set A to its power set, which takes an element of the set and outputs a set containing that element. And then we had a function M from pairs of integers to integers where M takes A and B and just multiplies. And now let's ask, are the, uh, are, is, you know, which of these is an injection? Actually, I should create some more space here. So, um, so let's look at the, so, so the question we're asking is, is this uh, one to one? I prefer to say one to one because it's more visceral. It kind of reflects what the concept means. So again, it's a new concept. And whenever we're faced with a new concept, we should be thinking in our heads, you know, what is the, what is the definition? And so in this case, F is one to one means that, okay, for every X one and X two in the domain, um, x1 squared equals x2 squared implies x1 equals x2, right? That's what the definition is. That's what the definition says when applied to this function f. So that tells us how to check whether this is true or not. So is this true that for any two integers, if their squares are equal, then they have to be equal? No, because it includes negative integers. Yeah, exactly. So this is this is no, because uh, f of minus one equals f of one equals one. So this is not one to one. Okay, let's look at the second example. Uh, the second example is is actually no for the same reason. I won't repeat the argument. Uh, third example, again, let's write down the definition. It, this is asking, well, for every pair of x1 and x2 in the reals, is it true that e to the x1 equal e to the x2 implies x1 equals x2? So is that true? If you have two numbers whose exponentials are equal, do they have to be equal? Yes, and we can confirm it by taking like the uh, natural logarithm. Of yeah. either side. Yeah, this is true because, uh, you know, th this, uh, because e to the x1 equals e to the x2 implies log of e to the x1 equals log, natural log of e to the x2 implies x1 equals x2. And this is true for arbitrary x1 and x2. In fact, that's, that's a proof, right? Um, okay, and I, I can do sort of I can do similar things for the for the other two. Uh, maybe let's just do one more since it is a little less familiar. Here I'm asking: Is it true that for any two elements of the of the domain, is it true that if the set containing a one is equal to the set containing a two, then a one is equal to a two? Is that true? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And again, you could write a proof if you want. And here, this one, I'll skip the answer. No, you can check for yourself later. So these are exact, these are functions that you know, some of these are one to one, some of them are not. And one thing I want to highlight is that this concept kind of, I mean, this concept is different from the concept of a uh, function being, uh, okay, sorry, let me undo that, uh, uh, a function being on onto, which is the other, other thing we discussed. 
Uh, so let me make a little more space here and make another column. So in the last lecture, we asked, are these on to? And so this one is no, this one is yes, this one was no, this one was no, and this one was yes. And what you can see from this is that all combinations are possible. We haven't seen yes, yes, but we'll see that in a moment. So these two concepts are really different. You can have one without the other, neither one implies the other one in general. So any questions about these examples? Okay, so now I'm going to um, look at uh, Uh, I'm, I'm going to define one more concept, which you're probably intuitively familiar with, but I want to define it formally. It's a composition of two functions. So if f going from b to c and g going from a to b are functions, uh, the function, it's written g, uh, oh, sorry, uh, I've got it. I wanted to do this the other way. Let's call this G and call this F. Or actually I want to be consistent with the book. So let's, let's do it like this, F and G. Then the function F of G going from A to C defined by F of G of A is just F applied to G of A is the composition. of f and g and the order matters here okay so f of g is not the same thing as g of f right in the first one you apply g first and then f in the other one you apply f first and then g so so the, the cartoon associated with this is very straightforward it said well you had this function g going from a to b and now you have this function f going from b to c and so if you have an element, little a and a, well, then it gets mapped to some g of a, which is an element of b. Well, you can apply f to that. And you get this element f of g of a of c. And if you look at the direct, if you define a new function that just does both of those things, that's f of g. And of course, you need the codomain of g to be the same as the domain of f for this to make sense. Otherwise, this doesn't even make sense, right? So, okay, I mean, you've seen this in calculus uh, many times. I, I, won't show, I won't show any examples right now, but we'll see some later in the, in the lecture. We'll prove some interesting things about this. But any questions about this definition? Okay. So one, there's one more important thing, which is what happens when a function is both one-to-one -one and one-to. So it's both injective and surjective, and that's a special important case. So if a function a from a to b is one-to-one um, -one and onto, it is called a bijection. There are many names for this. It's also called a one-to-one -one correspondence. It's also called invertible, or well, maybe I'll leave that out for now. And a, a very special thing happens when you have a bijection. So let's look at the definitions of one-to-one -one and onto. So the definition of onto says that for every element B, the inverse image of the set containing B has at least one element. And the definition of one-to-one -one says, well, for every element B, the inverse image of the set containing B has at most one element. So if both of those things hold, then the inverse image of the set containing B has exactly one element. And that's, that's interesting because that means I can define uh, a new function, right? So 
So notice, if f is a bijection, um, for every element in the codomain, there is exactly one element in the domain such that f of a equals b. So the picture associated with the bijection is something like you have some elements in the domain and the codomain, and the arrows look like this: that uh, you know every element in the codomain gets hit by an arrow, and everybody else in the codomain gets hit by exactly one arrow. So that means you can reverse the arrows, right? So therefore, can define a new function. Uh, F inverse from B to A by the rule. So remember, a function is a rule which assigns an element of its of the codomain to each element of its domain. By the rule, F inverse of B equals A if F of A equals B. And there's only one. There's no ambiguity. There's only one A which has that property. Is A is meant it? to be an element of B? Sorry, no. A is meant to be an element of A. Thank you. Uh, if there's a one-to-one -one correspondence, like if there's one element in one equal to one element in the other, does that mean that uh, the domain and codomain have to be the same size? That's a great question. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, you're asking if there's a bijection, do the domain and codomain have to be the same size? We'll deal with that in just a moment. So, so this new function is called the inverse. F. Um, and the important property of the inverse is that when you compose it with F, you get the identity, you get the function that doesn't do anything. So the important property of the inverse is that if you look at F inverse of F, well, let's say you apply that to some A. So what does that do? That's F inverse of F of A. But then according to this rule, this should just be whichever element maps to F of A, but that's just A, right? So this is true for every A and A. And you can do the same reasoning here. F of F inverse applied to B is F of F inverse B is B for every B and B. So the inverse just undoes whatever F does. And this notion of having an inverse is actually equivalent to being a bijection. So it's, it's, it's an easy exercise that I won't spend time on here, but this is sort of an easy fact, which is that F has an inverse if and only if f is a bijection. We've proved one direction of this, right? We proved that if it's a bijection, it has an inverse because I defined the inverse. We can also check that if it has an inverse, then it's a bijection. Okay. Now let's let's look at maybe one familiar example of a bijection and inverse from calculus. Let's consider the function f going from the interval minus pi over two, pi over two, to the real numbers by f of x equals tangent of x. So you've probably plotted this function at, at some point, and you see that it has some asymptotes at minus pi and pi minus pi over two and pi over two. And this function is, um, well, is one to one and on two. So here the domain is the x-axis, the codomain is the y-axis, this is a graph. And you can see that from these asymptotes, I mean, we're appealing to properties of calculus here, that every element in the codomain is the image of exactly one element of the domain. So, so this is a, is a bijection. 
And uh, the what's the inverse function? I mean, the inverse function is like an inverse of x, which I guess we sometimes call arc tangent. Yeah, so it's just a thing you're used to. With f inverse of x is arc of x. Okay, so now somebody brought up a very interesting question, which will actually be, which we will actually be thinking about for the rest of the lecture. Which is, uh, when do two sets have a bijection? Does it have something to do with their size? And so what we'll do is, uh, I'll actually prove a little proposition here. Prove that uh, two finite sets have the same cardinality. That just means number of elements, if and only if. So, so let, or, or you know, uh, let's just give these things name. Let's, let's just use the notation and give these things names. So let's just say cardinality of A is equal to cardinality of B, if and only if there is a bijection. F going from A to B. So exists for finite, so for finite sets A and B. So this answers your question for finite sets. Infinite sets are more interesting and we'll, we'll look at them in a bit. So let's let's prove this. So it's an if and only if type statement, right? So to, it's a biconditional. So to prove it, I have to prove both directions. So a common notation that we use in writing proofs of biconditionals is this. We put a forward arrow to indicate we're proving that the first statement implies the second. And then we prove that. And then later we put a backward arrow. So let's prove that the first statement implies the second. So you have two finite sets A and B with the same number of elements. And what we need to do is produce a bijection. Well, we have to use that they're finite, or at least we can use that. So, so let's. Uh, what can we say about finite sets? So we can we can give the elements names a one through a n. We can do that, right? Because they're finite, and n is the same in both cases. So really we're saying that there exists an N such that this is true. And all of that is implicit in the word let here. Really we're, we're sort of producing this N from the assumption that they have the same uh, cardinality. So now what's the bijection? We could just map um, A1 to B1 and then A2 to B2 all the way to AN yeah. to the N. So define f going from a to b by f of a i equals b i for i going from one to n. You just list them side by side and map the first one to the first one in b and so on. And then you can check this as a bijection. I will skip this now. You can check. So that, that's the proof of the first direction. Now for the second direction, I have to prove that if there is a bijection, then the cardinalities are the same. Any thoughts on how to proceed here? Well, okay, so it's actually a little bit cleaner to prove um, the contrapositive. Oh, yeah, go on. I, I was going to propose that maybe we could like use the property of surjectivity um, combined with like the the inverse. Um, but it, it like you, you could say 
for every element of B, there has to be a unique element of A that maps onto it. Um, so you could, hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know that that's quite yeah, so going to be enough though. You know, this is an interesting point because, you know, we've been doing this since we were children, right? This is how we learned to count. Like why are three apples the same as three oranges? Well, you can you can make a one-to-one -one correspondence. Why is it the same number? Well, you can make a one-to-one -one correspondence. Now, unfortunately, this is, this is one of those cases where it's somehow something that's, it's easier to write the proof if you try to prove the contrapositive. So, 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 so let's prove the contrapositive. So we will show the contrapositive. So that means assume, now assume a cardinality of A is not equal to cardinality of B. But here I'm gonna introduce another device that's used a lot in mathematical proofs, which is the phrase without loss of generality. That cardinality of A is less than the cardinality of B. Without loss of generality means we're not excluding any, you know, cases by saying this. What this is saying is, well, assuming the contra the contrapositive, you have to assume A is not equal to B, the cardinality of A is not equal to cardinality of B, or well, one of them has to be smaller. Let, you know, just choose the name so that A is the one that's small. And this phrase is very useful. Otherwise you could do well, case one, cardinality of A is less than B, case two, cardinality of B is less than A and write that case two is the same as case one, or you could just use this phrase. So assume this is true. So what that means is A has some M elements and B has, sorry, B1, N elements for some M less than N. So this sum is indicating that I've, you know, that there exists an M less than N such that this is true. So, okay, so now we have to show that there, uh, there is no, uh, we have to show that there is, there is no bijection. So how do you show that there is no bijection, right? So, well, one way of showing that is you show for every function, it's not a bijection. So let F going from A to B be an arbitrary function. And we will show it's not a bijection and then we'll be done, right? Because then we said if the cardinalities are not the same, then there's no bijection because this was an arbitrary function. So the keyword here, important logical keyword here is arbitrary. And the important keyword there was sum. That's an existential quantifier. So, okay, so how are we gonna show it's not a bijection? So the picture now is that A is here, B is here, or maybe I'll draw a new picture. The picture here is that A is here, B is here. A has less elements than B. And now I have some function from A to B, some arrows. How am I gonna show it's not a bijection? You could just map uh, A1 to B1 all the way to AM to BM, at which point we'd have N minus M elements. From. Yeah, but you can't do that, right? Because F is arbitrary. We don't have the freedom to choose F. F could be doing anything. Wouldn't we just show could it's you... not one to one? Uh, well, you okay. So idea, let's think about ideas here. Ideas, one is, uh, consider f of a1 go to b1, et cetera. But this doesn't work because it needs to not an arbitrary f, right? The second idea is uh, show not one-to-one. -one. Well, I don't know. What if f is this function? This is one-to-one. -one. That's not gonna work, right? Because there is an f from a to b. 
There could be an F from A to B that is one to one. In fact, there always is in this case. That doesn't work either. Could you take their set difference? Numbers. Take their set difference. Okay, what would you do? I mean, they could just be disjoint, right? They don't have to have anything to do with each other. Hmm. So the set difference could be the empty set. Can we take the inverse of B? And... In, well, you can't take the inverse of, oh, oh, you mean the inverse of the set B, the, the inverse image of B? Yeah. So you're saying, consider the inverse image, um, make this a little bigger. Well, the inverse image of B is just everything in A that gets mapped to something in B. That's just going to be A. What is a way to show that the range and the codomain aren't the same thing? Yeah, that's that's a good idea. That means you want to show it's not onto, right? We oh yeah, show. not onto. Show F is not onto. Now, what, why is that? Looking at this cartoon. Because for the second cartoon, you have A to B, although it's one to one, it's missing one element in B. So if we show that a, a B is not, um, F is not onto, then we can show that they're, um, like it doesn't satisfy the onto part of our proposition. Okay, but remember, F may not even be one to one, right? We don't know what F is, it's an arbitrary function. So all you can use here is that F is a function from A to B. So, so mm -hmm. maybe what we should say is, like for each element of A um, in A, uh, it's gonna map onto at most one unique element in B. Um, and maybe you could sort of do something by talking about like, it's either gonna map onto a unique element or it's gonna map onto an element some earlier, like A of uh, like, uh, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. a great so, thought. That's a really good Not thought, on. right? Because f is an arbitrary function. So what do we know about a function? Well, it's a rule that maps every element of the domain to exactly one element of the codomain. So we must we must have to use that, right? So let's use that. And I've become really quick at resetting this graphics crashing. So I'm going to do that now. Um, we professor, can't hear you if you're talking. You. That's the one thing I have to get. I have to remember to unmute. Does every element of A is mapped to exactly one element of B? The image of A has at most n elements, right? Because each element of A gets mapped to exactly one element of B, and things may be repeated, but you're never going to create more images, right? So therefore, there's some element of B that's not in the image of A. How would we do a formal proof of this? Um, well, so th this is a formal proof, but maybe you're wondering how do you write so, so the interesting, all the content of this proof is happening in uh, in this section here, right? And maybe you're wondering yeah. how do you write that in propositional logic? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so this is something which is not really reducible to anything simpler, I would say. Um, in, so it's, um, 
I mean, I guess it's it's an argument that uh, I think you would just write the sentence. So it's perfectly fine to write a sentence in, in propositional logic. So the proposition is just a statement that's true or false. It just has to be precise enough. That's okay. We don't have a special notation for this argument, but that's what we want. So is it kind of like the the product of like a, us being in a not um, non axiomatic like proof system? Uh, right kind now? of, yeah. Okay, you're saying if we wanted to write a proof that a computer could read, we would have to set up some way of formally saying this not in English. But yeah, we haven't done that. But this is really okay. the fact we're cool. using is that f is a function, right? That's the property we're using. Does it map to exactly one element? Each element of a is mapped to exactly one element of b. Did you mean that f of a has at most m ele Sorry, elements? Sorry, m. Yeah, thank you, thank you. M elements. Sorry, b had m. So and okay, so yeah. By therefore, I really mean since n is bigger than m. Okay, so so we just proved that two sets have the same cardinality if and only if there's a bijection. That's a useful fact. It gives us a way to prove two sets have the same cardinality, which we'll be doing a lot in this course. Um, I have a question about without loss of generality. So, mm -hmm. um, if we want to use that in a general proof, like how do we prove that we can use that? So, without loss of generality is just it's just a shorthand phrase. Which, which means that there is some obvious to the reader uh, um, uh, usually cases that are all the same up to renaming the variables. So in this case, this means that, well, you know, if A is not equal to B, uh, then one of them has to be smaller, right? It can mean different things depending on the context, but what's assumed is uh, it it should be um, still it should be clear to the reader what is meant. So this is more uh, this is more a part of the way we write informal proofs as opposed to the formal logical underpinnings. I mean the the, the logical content of it is that. Uh, we wanted to prove every something for all sets A and B, but it's enough to prove it when the size of A is less than the size of B, because otherwise I can switch their rules. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. Thanks. Okay. okay. So now we move on to the more interesting question of infinite sets. So, so before I so this is cardinality of infinite sets. And you know, we have many interesting infinite sets, right? We have the set of integers, we have the set of positive integers, we have the set of rational numbers, we have the set of real numbers, we have the product of the set of integers with itself, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And how do we compare their sizes? So these are all infinite sets, right? And Maybe before taking this course, I mean, certainly before I took this course, I was like, oh, infinity is just infinity, right? Infinity is, it's just like a sort of, it's just one concept. But there are actually different kinds of infinity. There are different sizes of infinity. Some infinities are bigger than others. And that's what we're going to study in this, uh, in this section. So, so here, here I'm going to define when two infinite sets have the same size. So uh, two uh, sets, A and B, so they may be infinite now, have the same cardinality uh, which is denoted magnitude of A equals magnitude of B if there is a bijection f from one set to the other. So this is consistent with what we just proved for finite sets, right? That was before we took it as a definition. We had a different definition of the size of a finite set. But this is consistent 
with what we did had for finite sets. Now we're going to define this. This is the definition of what it means for two infinite sets to have the same size, the same cardinality. And this is, you know, it's intuitive, right? If they're in one-to-one -one correspondence, then somehow they're the same size. This is uh, the reason why it's a reasonable definition. And we're going to be particularly interested for now in knowing which sets have the same cardinality as a set of positive integers. So that will have, we'll have a definition for that. So first of all, uh, an infinite sequence is a bijection from the positive integers to any set A. So this is sometimes called an enumeration of the elements of A. Because after all, what are you doing? You're listing the elements of A. Like right? one, two, three, four, and so on. And uh, a set is countable if it has such a bijection. So a set A is countable. Again, a very intuitive word. It means you can count the elements. If um, it is finite or it has the same cardinality as the positive integers, which is the same thing as saying it can be enumerated. So we're gonna now focus, so the positive integers are infinite, right? An accountable set is one which has the same size as the positive integers in this very specific sense. So any questions about the definition before we look at some examples? Uh, yeah, I had a question on the last line you wrote. Mm -hmm. um, so just to clarify, even if it's infinite, um, so could, sorry, could you explain um, if it is finite or, so, sorry, the or um, the cardinality of positive integers equals A, could you just? Yeah, the word countable literally means it's either finite or it has the same cardinality as the positive integers. Yeah. Okay. So let's look at some examples to understand what this definition means. So, so obviously the positive integers are countable, right? Um, why are the positive integers countable? there's a bijection from the cap the positive integers to the positive integers yeah there's always a bijection from a set to itself namely the identity function so that's fine but let's look at a maybe more interesting example let's look at all the integers so this set contains the positive integers it has infinitely more numbers than the positive integers so at some level, it looks like it's bigger, but actually it's countable. Now, let's see why. So the claim is that this set is countable. So let's, so remember, a set is countable if there's a bijection from that set to the positive, from the positive integers to that set, which is the same thing as saying that there is a way to enumerate the set. There's an infinite sequence where um, each element of the set appears exactly once. Right? So the, the key thing about the enumeration is that uh, uh, each element of the set appears exactly once. And that comes from the fact that this is a bijection from positive integers. 
Um, so, 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 so how do we prove that this is countable? Anybody see a way to like list all of its elements? Um, zero, negative one, one, negative two, two. Good. So proof number one is consider the sequence zero, one, negative one, two, negative two, three, negative three, dot, 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 dot. So that is a bijection from the positive integers to the set of uh, integers. Although, uh, I mean, we could try to prove that formally. So, and but we could just say that observe that each uh, integer appears exactly once. In the sequence. And so that's it. So therefore, the set of all integers is countable. Okay. Now, this may. So I claim this is a perfectly valid proof. It's it's it, it's completely precise, in the sense that it's it's um, you know every reader who is not trying to play devil's advocate will understand what this proof means. But if you wanted to be really pedantic, or if you just were not sure, you could write a really formal proof, an even more formal proof by explicitly constructing the bijection, like explicitly writing down the function. So what is the bijection underlying this proof number one? Um, we could define f of n uh, is equal to. Hmm. This gets tricky when we're around zero. I think we might have to define some special, but uh, basically, like if n is even, uh, we divide it by two and we take the positive. Um, if n is odd, we subtract one. Uh, divide by two and take the negative. Yeah, that was very quick. Very impressive that you figured that out on the spot. But yeah, indeed, if you define this function, this is a function from positive integers to integers. If you just list the values, so you list f of one, f of one, one is odd, so then you just get zero. f of two is one f of three is minus one, you actually get the sequence that's written above. This won't be written in the proof, I'm just doing that for pedagogy. And now you can prove that this is one-to-one -one and on-to. I won't do it here since it's, it's not that interesting. So prove f is one-to-one -one and on-to. Or I don't know. Uh, actually, I'm okay. Do people want me to do it? If people want me to do it, I'll do it. So who wants me to do it? Uh, I think that would be nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, why not? Since it's the first one. So so let's do it. Okay. So we will show f is one to one and on to. So let's first show it's one to one. So what does that mean? So now we go back to the definition of one to one, right? So the definition of one to one is is here. It's one to one if for every a one and a two, f of a one equals f of a two implies a one equals a two. So we, that tells us how to prove it, right? So assume n one and n two are positive integers, and assume f of n one equals f of n two. Now we need to show that n1 equals n2, and then we'll be done, right? Well, this function has a bit of a clunky definition, right? It's one thing if, if n is even, and another thing if n is odd. But there is one nice thing, right? If f of n1 equals f of n2, they have to have the same sign, right? 
So observe that f of n1 and f of n2 have the same sign because they're equal. So either uh, both n1 and n2 are odd, or even or n1 and n2 are odd. I'm just applying the definition of the function. Now what do I do? Um, that came from the that. fact that the, um, the second part of the function is takes the negative of it if it's odd, right? Yeah, so, so the point is that f of n is either positive or negative. And if it's negative, it has to take the second part of the function, right? Because n is always a positive. Got it. n is never negative. n is going from 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. But yeah, it's a how, good question. Sorry, how is the sign connected to um, if they're even or odd? Well, it's in the definition, right? So f of n is some positive number. So the key thing is that this, this number is always positive and this number is always negative, right? So if f of n1 is equal to f of n2, then they're either both positive or both negative. So they're either both even or both odd. Okay. So, um, now we have to do a proof by cases. We don't know which case we're in. We have to consider both cases. So case one is that N1 and N2 are even. So what happens in this case? Um, we see that since F of N1 equals F of N2, uh, mm -hmm. We have n1 over 2 equals n2 over 2, which yep. means n1 equals n2. Yep. Okay, but now we're not done. We have case 2. n1 and n2 are odd. In this case, we apply the second part of the definition. Since minus n1 minus 1 over 2 equals minus Two minus two over two, or minus one over two. Sorry. Um, n one minus one equals n two minus one, and n one equals n two in this case as well. So we're happy in both cases. So that's it. We're done. Well, we're done showing it's one to one. Now we need to show it's on to. So, well, how do we show it's on to? Well, let's go to the definition of on to. We need to show for every element in the codomain, there's an element in the domain that maps to it. So assume, um, M, is an arbitrary integer. Now I need to prove that there's some n so that f of n equals n. Any thoughts on how I should do it? How am I going to find this n? Because this picture is I have z here, I have z plus here. I have this M sitting here, and I need to show that it came from somewhere. Maybe we should split this into two cases, like where when M is even and when M is odd, because that relates to like what we were identifying earlier with. Uh, okay, it's a or, good Sorry, thought. not even and odd, I mean positive and negative. Yeah, positive and negative maybe, right? So yeah, so I'm just gonna write this very quickly. So if M is negative, observe, that or let, let's do let's do non uh, let's do pause, strictly positive first. Observe that f of two m equals m. 
right? Because UM is always even. So it falls in the first case. If M is non-positive, observe that. Here you have to be a little tricky. You have to do a little thought experiment. You're looking for an N so that minus N minus one over two equals M, right? Well, okay, let's, so that means N minus one equals minus two M N equals minus two M plus one. So let's do that. Observe that F of minus two M plus one, which is always odd, by the way, equals M. And that's it, it's on to. Because I exhibited for every M and N, right? So this is the thing that's going to be my N. That maps to M. So this, this is actually the same. In some ways, this is just a very formal version of this proof number one. Proof number one is actually perfectly fine. But proof number two is it's giving us a little more information. It's it's kind of explicitly telling us how to, you know, quickly compute the bijection, for example. Right? Proof number one isn't telling us that. It's just saying, hey, there's a bijection. You know, it's not going to tell you exactly how to compute it, but there is one. So, any questions about this? Is everybody okay with the concept of an infinite sequence? Like, um, you want me to say a bit more about why infinite sequences and bijections are the same? Um, yes. Okay. Yeah. So let me say. Let me add a remark. Uh, the bijection uh, f. So so given a bijection. Yeah. So given a bijection. Or let me, let me just not write in English. Let me just say so. So let's say you have a bijection f going from positive integers to some set. Then you can turn this in. So this is a bijection. You can turn this into the following infinite sequence: f of one, f of two, f of three, dot dot dot. Right. Whenever you have a bijection, you have an infinite sequence. Which is actually an enumeration, which means every element appears exactly once. What does that mean? Like, what's the sequence where elements are going to appear twice, and why would that make well, it? Yeah, I could define one, right? I could look at a sequence like this. That's not an okay. enumeration, right? So okay, it's a special so... property that every element appears exactly once. Okay, so like if we were to say that like, if we're trying to prove that all real numbers are countable, how would we go about that? Yeah, like, we'll get to that in a moment. It's a great question. Okay. And similarly, if you have some, any old sequence, A1, A2, A3, et cetera, you can turn it into a function by looking at the function F of N equals A. So bijections with the, with the positive integers and, Enumerations of sets are the same thing. And we, you know, in proof number one, we wrote it in the language of sequences, and kind of implicitly defined as bijection. And proof number two, explicitly defined by. Okay, let's look at a more interesting example, example two. Let's look at the set Z cross Z set of all pairs of integers. Wait, sorry, could you like go back to the um, the other page for like five seconds? Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay. So now I'm gonna, now the claim is that this is also probable. What's the proof? I'm going to use, I'm going to enumerate these, right? So consider the infinite array where I just write these 
in the sort of most natural way. One, 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 two, one, three, one, four, one, five. And here I have two, one, two, 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 three, two, four. Could you radiate out from the center? Excuse me? Could you count them by radiating out of the center? Radiating out of the center, great thought. Well, where is the center? Zero, zero, I mean. You mean one, one? Are, is it only positive integers? Or... Oh, sorry, yeah, 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 sorry, positive integers, my bad. Yeah, so in that in this case, I would mean um, going from one one to one two two one, then one three two two three one and so on. Okay, I think I get what you're saying. So let me specify one way to enumerate these. So let d sub s be the set of pairs in the set of positive integers cross itself, such that the sum is equal to s. So this is D1, this is D2, this is D, sorry, th this is D2, sorry, this is D2, because the sum of the entries here is two. This is D3, this is D4, this is D5, and so on. And notice that every pair in this product set appears in exactly one diagonal. Let's call these, diag call these diagonals. I'm just defining that to be called a diagonal. And now um, there are many things I could do. So I think what you proposed is to just list the elements of each diagonal one after another, right? So consider the sequence, uh, the elements of the first diagonal, we need to specify an order. And so, Let's do right to left. And I, I forget in your sequence, were you doing were you doing a sort of snake pattern or just always going? Uh, sorry, I guess this is left to right. Were you always doing left to right or right to left? Uh, I was going to go from right to left across the diagonals. Okay, so yeah, so just just go from just do this right. So just, just list all of the diagonals from left to right, element, followed by elements of D, sorry, this is not D1, this is D2 left to right, elements of D3 left to right, followed by elements of D4 left to right, dot, dot, dot. So that obviously, that's a well-defined infinite sequence of elements of the set. Now the key property is every element, every pair of positive integers appears exactly once in this sequence. Why is that? Well, I can, I can just tell you, so, so notice that every, pair in this product appears exactly once in the sequence. And now I can tell the reader specifically where, specifically in the diagonal corresponding to the sum of those numbers, right? You give me a pair, you add the numbers up, you get one of these diagonals. And that's going to appear at some point in the sequence. It's only going to appear once. And so my element's only going to appear once, exactly once. Okay. 
that's it. That's a bijection from positive integers to z plus to positive integers cross itself. So thus, the sequence is an enumeration. of this. So the cardinality of this set is actually just equal to the cardinality of Z plus. Okay, there's, by the way, there, there are many possible bijections. Another thing the proof reveals. I could have alternated the direction of traversing the diagonals. I could have done some other thing. There are many, many ways of listing the pairs of integers. This is just one of them. So any questions about this? So would something similar work if you did like the positive integers cross the positive integers cross the positive integers? Yeah, it's a it's great point. Track. So here's a general fact. If A and B are countable, so is A Cartesian product B. And then, yeah, you could do it two, three, you could do it a bunch of times. So all those things have the same cardinality. So are, are infinite and countable. So, I mean, okay, it, it's true for countable, right? But for, so, so for infinite sets, cardinality of A cross B is equal to cardinality of A. Uh, sorry, is, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, if they're both countable, let's just leave it at this. So one remark, which you can read about in the book. So you should read this because it's cool. A similar argument with one more tweak shows that the rational numbers are countable. Let's say the positive rationals. There's a way to list them. And basically it's just said, well, you can write each one as P over Q. Then you can make the same kind of table with P's and Q's with P over Q. You can do this kind of diagonals thing. You have to be a little bit careful because you don't want an element to appear twice. So there's a little thing you have to do, but you can read about that in the book. Somebody raise their hand. Yes, I just have one question. Like what is the definition of countable? Is it when it's exactly one? appears exactly once. Countable is it's finite or it's the same cardinality as the positive integers. Gotcha, thank you. And that's the same thing. Yeah, okay, maybe I'll clarify. It's countable if and only if there is an enumeration of its elements. Right. So bijection from Z plus to A is the same thing as cardinality of Z plus equals cardinality of A. Okay, so since we're running out of time, let me show you the most interesting example, which is a set that's not countable. Let's consider the set of real numbers in the open interval zero to one. So as you learned at some point in school, every number here has a possibly infinite decimal expansion. It has a decimal expansion, zero dot x1, x2, x3, dot, 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 dot. It may have more than one, but it, it, has, it has one. Okay. Now, the sort of quite stunning claim is that this set is not countable. Uncountable, which means not Countable. So there's no way of listing its elements in a way such that every element of the set appears exactly once. Equivalently, there's no bijection, i.e. for every function from the positive reals to the set, F is not a bijection. 
That's what it means to be uncountable, right? This is a stunning fact. This is really one of the historically important facts in the history of math. It was proven, I don't know, sometime in the last 150 years. So let's prove this. This is a really cool proof, which shows up in many areas of math. Okay. Well, we know what we have to show. We have to show if you have any function from positive integers to the set, it's not a bijection. Okay. So assume f is any function. And you know, functions from the integers to any set, they they you know they correspond to sequences, right? Sorry, I, I think I I'm sorry, an infinite sequence is a function from a set to the thing. Uh, um, if it's a bijection, it's called an enumeration. Okay, so infinite sequence is just any old function. And if it's a bijection, then it's an enumeration. So assume you have some enumeration. Uh, so assume you have some function mapping the positive, some sequence of real numbers. We'll show it's not an enumeration. So we will show something more specific. We'll show F is not onto. Then it can't be a bijection, right? So here, so what, what, what am I going to do? I'm going to list F of one, F of two, and so on, right? So list. So consider the sequence of decimal expansions. So we have f of one, which is some decimal expansion of some number. So let's call that, let's call the digits d11, d12, d13, d14, dot, 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 dot. Then f of two, is d21, d22, d23, d24, dot, dot, dot. f of 3 is d31, d32, d33, d34, so on. Can everybody still see, by the way? Um, oh, no, it's frozen now. Yeah, so what we've done is we've list, we have this function on the table, right? So we can list out all these numbers and we can list their decimal expansions. And my goal is to show that this is not onto. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna construct a real number X. So we will construct some number X in this interval such that F of N is not equal to X for every N in this list. So the pattern here, by the way, is that DIJ is the Jth digit of the ith number, uh, of, which is f of, f of i. Okay, so there are many ways to do this, but there's a really there's a really slick way. So let x be the number whose digits are x1, x2, x3, dot dot dot, where x i. I'm going to design it to be different from the ith number in the ith digit. Okay, so x i, I'm gonna define it to be four if d i i is equal to, let's say five, and five if d i i is not equal to five. 
So that's a valid definition of a number. Okay, so this is called a diagonalization argument. What I'm doing is I'm looking at the ith digit of the ith number. And the key is that x, the way I'm defining x, so the key point is it differs from fi in the ith digit. So by construction, x differs from f of i uh, on the ith digit, right? If the ith digit of f i was four, then uh, was five, then x i is four. And if it was not five, then it is five. So it's always different. So this is the key point. But now I'm done, right? Because I have produced a real number that's not on the list, that's different from every element in the range of f. Thus, x is not in the range of f. So f is not a bijection. Okay, so that's it's a short proof, but it's a really cool idea. This is this technique is called diagonalization for reasons that you can see. But it, it, it's really quite uh, sophisticated, right? I'm considering an arbitrary function and showing it's not onto. And the way I'm doing it is I'm looking very closely at that function and then carefully constructing an element that's not in its range. So yeah, somebody has a question? Um, it's sort of looking, so this is really neat. Uh, reading through the textbook in terms of like, it seems to allow us to do some interesting non-constructive proofs. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to further classify like sizes of infinity once you get into non-countables? Uh, yeah, there is, there is. So I'll, um, I'll say a bit more about that maybe in the next lecture. Uh, so the question is, is there a way to compare sizes of infinity? Can we compare sizes of infinity beyond countable? And the answer is uh, yes, definitely. So there's a, a definition which is in the book, which I encourage you to read, which is that the cardinality of A is less than or equal to the cardinality of B if um, there is a one-to-one -one function F going from A to B. And we say that cardinality of A is strictly less than B if cardinality of A is at most the cardinality of B and they're not equal. So this is a way to compare different sizes of infinity and actually there are infinitely many different sizes of infinity. Which is actually something you end up proving on the homework, so yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Any other? Okay, so I didn't get to talking about writing and I've been meeting through the last two lectures. So what I decided is I'm gonna record a little like 10 minute video and just email it to you since I think many people are having questions about writing. But anyway, that's, that's it, so thanks. Ready, Ben?